the Chicago Bulls. Another putrid, middling, non-caring joke of a season from this franchise. Let's talk about it. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Sloyd and I actually wrote up the rules for entrance for the Burley Pavilion. And I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Fangio. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 with any winning $5 bet. I said that twice, but that's fine. Visit Fangio.com slash Locked On to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We're available on all platforms. And I realize the little YouTube things come up already because I mistimed it, but that's okay. You know to double bang. You know to thumb it up. And you know to leave your comments. Also, just quickly, I, I, I'm not responsible for writing the um, entrance rules slash guidelines for that um, disgusting looking place, Burley Pavilion. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably don't want to see it. It's pretty... It, and they, uh, the, the gutless legends they are turn off all their comments on their TikTok videos. Hmm, wonder why that is. Doesn't matter. Well, it does. It actually does matter. It doesn't matter for the context of this show. Um, the Bulls. This, you couldn't write a better scenario than this team being in the plane, not jumping up in the lottery, just committing to being mid, com- committing to not caring, to having a huge market, a passionate fan base who you just drive them to not care because you don't. The ownership doesn't care. The management doesn't care. The, the front of man- management, I'll put in like the business management part of it. Well, they care about making money, but that's it. The front office, any chance of a good move from them at any point? Maybe. So I guess some of the Kobe White contract was pretty good. But what are we actually doing on this team? I have no idea what to make of them. And we'll get into a few of these little things, but this this used to be my favorite team. People ask this question all the time, Josh, who do you go for? Nobody. For two reasons. I used to be the Bull, a Bulls fan for a very long time. I stopped being a Bulls fan for two reasons. The team, the franchise, the ownership, the Reinsdorfs, Garpax, who was the in charge at the time, the complete ineptitude, not caring about the product, not scouting draft picks, holding draft press conferences while the second round is still going, selling picks for money, not having any understanding of how to field a competitive team. And secondly, my job in the media means I sort of divest myself from being an individual team supporter. So yeah, for all of those who, those of you who ask that question, yeah, used to be a Bulls fan, haven't been for like six years, seven years maybe, and that's it. This team is frustrating. But they've also almost gotten to the point where I don't even have the energy to be angry at them. You know, I can get fired up about what the Hornets do with the injury reporting, what Detroit does with everything, Portland's fake Jeremy Grant injuries, the Lakers front office moves, what the Suns do, so many different teams. But for the Bulls, I almost, I just don't care. They've turned the biggest name in the sport, the biggest brand in the sport, into an afterthought that literally nobody cares about. And that's really sad. And I I do feel for Bulls fans. I've got a lot of friends who are Bulls fans in this industry as well, like... I just feel for them because they are passionate or some of them used to be and now they're just a little bit of like, what do we do? It's a good question. What do you do? Let's take a look at what this season was for the Chicago Bulls. You'd be shocked to know that they made the play in. They won a game. They lost in the second one. Same as the year before. And what it feels like it's going to be in perpetuity because again, they just don't understand how to fully rebuild, to fully tank, or to fully compete. 
They just want to sneak into the eighth seed, maybe get two home games in a playoff series, and call it a day. They were 39 and 43 this season, 19th on offense and 22nd on defense. It's almost the definition of mid. And going by the current definition of mid, which doesn't actually mean mid, it means bad, they're sort of right there in the lower third of the league. Their preseason over-under was 37.5. So actually, they went over. And if I look at my preseason win projections, my initial run at it, I had them at 35 wins. And then I updated it to 39 wins. So I basically banged, or not I basically, I banged them literally right on the head. Bang on 39, hit the over, W. Although, is it a W to say that the Bulls are going to be two games under 500? Like, or is that just what you expect them to be? Stink. They stink, this team. They make me mad, and they shouldn't, because I shouldn't care. I don't really. Again, I, I feel for fans, not for organizations. Draft lottery was yesterday. We did a mock draft already. Go check out the first 14 picks of that mock draft. I, as I predicted at the end of that mock draft show, I said there's going to be certain comments saying certain things, and there was. People don't listen or pay any attention to things that you say. And there's going to be a lot of changes. That's my usual process. We do the lottery, do the first mock, and then all the information starts to get gathered. Because I don't pay attention to college basketball in any real significant way during the NBA season. But now for the next two months is where we start to do it. And it all ramps up. So we have your initial impressions, which is the first mock. And then we build on it. As we move through, we talk to so many different people, read things, watch things, and then that crystallizes. The Bulls have pick 11 in that mock. I actually picked them having uh, selected Donovan Klingon for them. There will be people who say, well, that's stupid. Klingon will go to the top three. If he does, I think teams are making a mistake, but I also might change my mind on that. I don't think Klingon is that good. I don't think he's that worth that much of a pick. But one thing I, I remain certain is that pick one or two in this draft is the equivalent to six or eight in a regular draft. Pick 11 is probably like pick 19. And that's sort of where I feel we are with this. But they've got pick 11 in the upcoming draft, the Chicago Bulls. I'm sure they'll do so many great things with it. Their most common starting lineup for the season is the one they ran with down the end of the season once Patrick Williams was ruled out for the year and Zach Levine was ruled out for the year. Kobe White, Io DeSumo, Alex Caruso, DeMar DeRozan, and the big fella in the middle, Nikola Vucevic. Their best lineup was similar, except it just had Patrick Williams in there for Alex Caruso, which I'm actually shocked at. Crusoe is usually the guy with the great advanced numbers and the great plus minus stuff, but their best lineup are plus 19.3 with almost 280, I think 280 minutes or 280 possessions. Let me double check that. Um, 276 possessions. There you go. It was a plus 19.3, which is 86th percentile of all lineups over 100 possessions in the NBA. White, DeSumo, DeRozan, Williams, and Vooch. And I think what, not sure what this tells you 100%, but it does tell you, I think, that like, Get some forwards at some point. Like, Patrick Williams is not very good, but he's almost the only forward on this team. You just need someone who's not DeMar DeRozan playing power forward. And I know that the Bulls will tell you that Alex Crusoe played power forward. That's to, you know, soothe a 34-year-old man's ego. DeMar DeRozan is their power forward because that's what he plays. That's why it's insane that he always appears on the All-Star ballot as a guard. Because he isn't, very clearly. Look at their free agents coming up. They've got three restricted guys. Two of them we don't care about that much. Adama Sonogo and Henri Drell. Sonogo played for UConn with Donovan Klingon last season. Um, I think he might be able to be... A, we saw him have that huge 2020 game, which I did call, unbelievably. Yeah, sometimes you get one right, don't you? Um, in the end of the season. I think he can work into being a backup big man. I would look to bring him back. Drell, absolutely no interest at all. None. The big one's going to be what they do with Pat Williams. Number four overall pick four years ago. He's got a $29.5 million cap hold. Obviously, I would I would bloody hope that he doesn't get paid $29.5 million a year. But he wants 20 a year. Like, I know that I'm I'm big on, let's try and pay for future production. Not someone's like, well, you don't pay them until they've done it. Because then by the time you actually pay them, they're not worth it. And then you run into situations where you have to end up trading Jimmy Butler because he wants $57 million a year and he's not worth that money at this point. Hmm, I wonder if that'll happen. But Patrick Williams, let's say I, I again, I, I do, I do cape. Is the right word? I, I, I push in for, pay the guys, let them work into some of that contract because you are, you know, behind in in the production level. But Williams also doesn't look like he'll be that good. He's never been that good. 
So I definitely wouldn't pay him at that level. You're not going to lose him because A, no one else is going to offer him 20 and you've got restricted rights. So we're interesting to see what they do. They obviously squeezed Kobe White and Ayo Desumu a lot last offseason. And if I'm going to give credit to a front office for doing the right thing by their team, that was it. That was great. They got bargain contracts on both of those blokes. How they assemble the roster is always questionable. We'll see what they do with Pat. So he's their restricted, main restricted guy. And then unrestricted, the big question is going to be what they do with their best forward, Javante Green. No, it's not. It's about DeMar DeRozan, but maybe it is about Javante Green. It's not. It's about DeMar DeRozan. I have no idea what this team will do. If they were a serious franchise, and they are not, they would not be entertaining anything close to bringing DeMar DeRozan back on a $30 million deal or whatever they're interested in giving. Like, it is insane to do that. But they probably will. They should have traded him. They might let him walk for nothing. It's almost 100% going to be a better move than bring him back on an outsized contract that limits what you can do in other areas, reduces what the team can develop into. And DeMar's, I say this all the time, and I've said this with Westbrook. Yeah, he's one of the main guys. It's not to say that these guys are at fault. It's not to say that DeMar DeRozan is at fault for teams giving money or playing him in these roles necessarily. Same with Westbrook. I'm not saying that you blame Westbrook because he can't shoot and takes bad shots. Maybe you can a little bit. But you also just, this is what he is. This is the player that they are. And it's about the coaches and the management recognizing what they are and putting them in the right roles to have success. And we know DeRozan can't defend. We know DeRozan can't shoot. We know that he requires a certain type of player around him, and you'll see that all of his advanced stats over the course of his career lead you to the understanding that well, maybe we can't build a super successful team around this guy. So teams shouldn't do that, but they do. And you're not gonna, I'm not going to blame DeRozan for being like, hey, look, I scored these points. Where's my money? Get your money. Do it. Maybe learn to shoot a three. I don't know. Not the point. So they will almost... What are they going to do? Two years, $80 million maybe for DeRozan? I don't know what they're going to do. It's going to be bad. Whatever contract they bring DeRozan back on, it's almost definitely going to be bad. And if they let him go for nothing, it's also bad. So you might say, I'm putting them in a no-win situation. They put themselves in that no-win situation. Now, if they get DeRozan two years, $30 million, then that's a huge W. It's just not going to happen. The other two are Andre Drummond, the big avocado, and Javante Green. Green was really, really strong in his nine games down the stretch. You don't want to rely upon a guy with busted knees who's 30, who's not really that level of player, but he was good. And Drummond was okay, but he's obviously way worse than he has been in the past. And you know, if I could get the Donovan Klingon at pick 11, or if he's not there, I get a Kyle Filipowski. That's what I do. Get a center at 11, put him as the backup, and he takes over from Vooch, hopefully very, very quickly. There's only one guy with an option on this team, and that is Tory Craig. He's got a almost $3 million player option. Craig, again, was like uh, Javante Green. Not a player that's great, but you've got no forward, so you're probably like he stands out in doing that, but he's a backup at best. And then a couple of non-guarantees. Alex Crusoe's deal is partially guaranteed for $9.9 million. Of course, that will be fully guaranteed because he's one of their best players. And the other one is two-way legend who'd played two minutes, I think, before they convert, convert his contract on a roll Tim. Who is just, again, a guy. No starter upside, no rotation upside, nothing like that. I'm running a little slow on this show for some reason. Yeah, I, I do tend to do that from time to time. So I've got one more thing to talk about before we get into the players. But before I do that, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and in the NHL because the playoffs are on. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, totals, player props, futures, whatever. Fangio will give you that $150 if you win a $5 bet. So go to fangio.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. Fangio is America's number one sportsbook and don't forget to gamble responsibly. All right, so... The last thing I wanted to talk about was the expiring contracts. And here we are with Lonzo Ball's contract expiring. I have absolutely no idea whether Lonzo Ball is going to be able to return. He has not played since, I believe, January 2021. And I know that there'll be somebody in the comments that may have already said it, or will go to say it now. The Bulls were the one seed when Lonzo got hurt. I can't, <clears throat> can't argue that that's not true because it was. They also weren't anywhere close to the best team in the league or a top five team in the league. And that was not going to hold. Right? I'm really, really confident in that. 
he made their team better because he's a really, really good player. But is he is hoping that Lonzo returns the key to this team? Like, uh, of course it isn't. If he does return, there is some real complicated conversations that need to happen in terms of how this rotation works because it is just all guards. Caruso, Levine, Dasumu, White, Ball. Somebody's not playing. Or not playing anywhere near enough. So that is going to be an interesting conversation. But Lonzo Ball is unrestricted. Then you've got Javon Carter, who will be having a player option after this season. So you would think he'd pick that up because he was terrible. And the other one is Andrew Funk, two-way legend, who will be a restricted guy. Um, coming off the two-way boot, like that doesn't matter. The Lonzo one's key. We'll hopefully get some more information whether he has to go into a medical retirement because honestly, if he's not ready to start this season, that's it for him. Surely it's it. Like he's just not coming back. The Bulls have kept him on the books, I'm guessing waiting to get it just scrubbed off because of medical retirement, but they can't do that yet because he hasn't been ruled not able to play. So we know they're in their penny-pinching ways. They're just holding that salary there the whole time. He is a very good player. But I, I don't know how you could have any confidence in Lonzo Ball coming back and lasting at this stage with his knee. And the procedure he had has an extraordinarily low success rate, the cartilage replacement. We, we hope that he's able to do it. But I, I am not having any faith in that whatsoever. I'm out until I see him back. And even then, I'd like to see that for a long period of time. So let's talk about the starting group on this squad. Let's start with the aforementioned DeMar DeRozan, who is almost he's going to be 35 next season. So you might think that I'm being harsh on DeRozan, and you'll tell me a lot of different things. He was 45th in minus one rankings. He played... 79 games and 38 minutes, which honestly is a a ton of minutes, a ton of games for a bloke that's this old. And it's remarkable that he played as much and as well as he did. 45th in minus one. Yahoo will rank him 14th because, again, that's a flawed system. Under no circumstance was DeMar DeRozan worth that much in value. And if you are using any of that stuff, and I think some of their rankings for the next season get built off the last season's numbers, like that's an insane, insane starting point. He was 31st in points leagues. His ADP was 47, and I did fade him. I was like, I'm not that interested in him in round four. And honestly, while he finished 45th, which is just bang on the ADP, if Zach Levine hadn't missed two and a half months, DeRozan wasn't sniffing this number. He was nowhere near this number until Levine got hurt, and then he had to play 38 minutes a night, and his usage had to go up. Remember that, big factor. 24 points, under a three, four and a half rebounds, five and a half assists, one steal, shot 48 and 85 one of the big things that it had kept DeMar as a top 30-ish player over the last couple of seasons with Levine there was absolutely elite, unsustainable two-point shooting. He shot 51 from two. It's good. It's not the 57 that he was going at before. And the free throws, he used to go at 88 on high volume, which was another thing that kept him in there. There are very big warning signs, as there have been for the last two years, that there is a decline happening with DeRozan. And it is masked, again, by that 14th finish in Yahoo. It's masked by 38 minutes a night. It's masked by the absences of other guys. But overall, his play declined. It was always set to decline. It will decline again. And I just... He might be back on this team. I don't know. I would expect lower usage if he is. He might be on another team, but his role is completely different. And I would be very, very... I'll tell you what now, I would never pick him top 50 in the draft next season. I'd be very shocked if he finishes a top 50 player next season. Very, very surprised. His best player comps, according to Crafted, year nine of Tony Kukoc. That's like back... That's Atlanta Hawks, Tony Kukoc. And year 12 of scoring legend Alex English, which makes a lot of sense in terms of the game that DeRozan has. Not saying that DeRozan was bad. I'm 100% not saying that. 83rd percentile EPM, 75th CPM. But this is one of the things that I'm I'm sort of focusing a lot more these days is that you can have these numbers and context is important. It's why like when I say I expected Jordan Poole to put up good numbers, it's not because I think he's good. It's because of the situation that he was in. And DeRozan's situation has always seemed to me to be, he can put up the numbers, but it, it's like the Brandon Ingram, isn't it? Where does your team go? What do you do with this? So the numbers, like he's fine. He's good. But finding the right role is so key. 83rd percentile EPM, 75th in CPM. And this is why I want to focus on that because the portability number, your ability to just move among different systems, play with different players on different teams, 44th percentile. Like that's not very good. 
It's because it requires so many different things around him. Passing, shooting, defense. Defense? That sounds really Aussie. Defense. 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 Um, it just makes him a tough fit. But we'll find out how much other teams value him. He's got a great rep in the league. He seems like a tremendous bloke. Like, really, really good bloke. And that, that goes a long way. But does it go a long way towards winning? Hmm. Speaking of going a long way towards winning, this guy doesn't. Nikola Vucevic. It is very easy to have opinions that change. Vuce, I think, was a very underrated player in his early Orlando Magic tenure. Vuce now is a bad starting center. And again, Vuce ranking start of last season came out as like 30 or whatever. I said, ah, no way. I am fading this guy completely. I had him at like 60. Eventually, Yahoo adjusted their ranking significantly down. His ADP came into 47. He still didn't beat it. He finished 51st minus one. There'll be people who tell me that I got Vuce wrong. You're just completely off on him. Absolutely. No, I was actually completely right. I was not off on him at all. Vuce is a significantly declining player. And the trade for him was insane at the time. The contract extension was insane at the time, and it is only going to get worse. He is 33, going to be 34 in six months. He played 34 minutes in 76 games. I don't know if you could have had a better situation in terms of being able to even boost his numbers because of Levine being out for as long as he was and then no Pat Williams. But if Levine was in, Vooch is getting nowhere near this. Like, not even close to it. 18 and 10 with 1-3, three, three assists, 0.7 steals, 0.8 blocks. And this was, I thought, a relatively easy one to look at for regression because he just had these random massive spikes in shooting, which didn't seem like it would fit. Plus, he sucks. And again, he used to be good. He is no longer good. He's, he's actually just bad now. And that's where the confusion... Well, look at that. He averaged almost 20 and 10, Josh. Cool. Still bad. Dama Sonogo had a 20 and 20 game. Moses Brown had multiple... Jalen Horde had 20 rebound games. Still bad. 55 on his twos, 29 on his threes. Shot 82 from the line. Like Again, the game suits fantasy. Scores, rebounds, nice assists for a center. You'd hope for a little bit more defensively, but great field goals. Well, not great. Okay, average field goals. Good free throws for a big man. It's all really good. But he's bad. The best comps for him are year 13 Al Jefferson. If you want to know who year 13 Al Jefferson is... It's the one that played for Indiana. Do you remember that? I think he started one game in that season. And year 13 of Chris Webber. The man is on the downside and is not a starting player anymore. But that he probably still will start because what else do they do? 59th on EPM, 46th percentile CPM. This is the, the thing though. 13th percentile free throw rate. Why did I say it with that intonation? I don't know. But... You gotta like DeAndre Ayton looks at that and goes, bro, come on. Show some physicality. He can't shoot. He needs the ball. He sucks defensively. Doesn't draw free throws. It's not it's not working. But people will overdraft him. They'll again tell me that I was wrong on him and that I was off and I'll continue to fade him at my peril. I was right. I I, I will I will be i very staunchly defend that I was right on Vooch. And he wouldn't have even gotten near 51 had it not been for Levine's injury. Just wouldn't have got near it. And it is it is going to be... I'm going to, I'll use this name because I think it is a good reminder. You, We are going to get, maybe not so with DeRozan, but with this guy, we are going to get a Kemba Walker where he's rolling at one point and then all of a sudden you go, oh, oh no, he's the 250th best player playing 20 minutes a night. What happened? Well, he's bad. That's what happened. And it's going to come. The cliff will hit. It'll hit hard, I think. Am I, again, am I anti Vooch? No, I'm just trying to be pro-reality. And I, I do like the guy, but I think it's pro-reality. Maybe, maybe I am delusional. Probably. Today's episode is brought to you by PricePix. PricePix is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick between two to six, at least two, of their individual stat numbers, and you just choose more than or less than. Some may say the grammar would suggest you say fewer than, but they wrote less than on this thing, so I'm going to read it as less than, even though I know fewer than is the correct thing. You've got the basketball playoffs rolling, the hockey playoffs, Major League Baseball, flying, you can play this in over 30 states as well. 
And now also you can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. 10 bucks converts to $1,000 in the basketball playoffs, hockey, baseball, whatever. Hopefully still disc golf as well. So download the app and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the Price Picks app. Use the code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks, pick more, pick less or fewer. It's that easy. So talked about those two old former stars who still have this franchise and a lot of fantasy managers in a huge chokehold. Let's talk about some other players. The skater boy, Zach Levine. I, I, I was wrong on Zach Levine. I saw him come in with an ADP of 50. I said, well, that's pretty silly. Why are we doing this? Why won't he just be as good as he was the year before where he was like 40th? Why are we got him at 50? Well, irrespective of the injuries, which cost him you know, all but 25 games, he, he was bad when he played. 81st in minus one, 72nd in points. He's 29. He played 35 minutes a night. It wasn't minutes. He just was bad. And a lot of this is sulking, whining, complaining, wanting a trade. Now, I get it. I wouldn't want to play for the Bulls either. But he also just tanked. Like, he just did not care anywhere near as much as he did in previous seasons. He, he just didn't. So do they honor his trade request? This, is, this team is so hard to know. Does Lonzo play? Does Levine get traded? Does DeRozan come back? What do they do with Patrick Williams? Do they ever decide that a forward is important? I, I, I just don't know. Levine averaged still 19 points, but it's a long way from 24. Five rebounds, four assists, 0.8 steals. He's always going to be bad at that. 45 and 85. And there's an idea... That Levine's just a terribly inefficient player. In the past, he just that's just hasn't been anywhere near true. He's been always a not always, but recently a really, really efficient scorer, getting four assists, five rebounds, three triples, 24, 25 points. That's an elite fantasy guy. He just usage fell away, shots weren't there, didn't care, didn't try. Done. The best comps for 35% from three. He's a 40% guy usually. I don't think that the cliff has come, but when you see age 29. On any player, you should always go, oh, hmm. Yeah, that's the age. That's the age where it's very unlikely you get better. And whether you stay stagnant or whether you fall is going to be a key thing. I don't think he's going to have a precipitous fall, but he might. He also might be on a completely different team. There is a huge chance that Levine, you said, look, look at those numbers there. He might get drafted in round eight or round seven. And I would love that. But I also worry that maybe this is just his new new normal. 54 on his twos as well. The best comps for him, year eight of Jalen Rose and year nine of Jamal Mashburn, form, uh, last season of Mashburn in Charlotte, I think that was. The advanced stuff still doesn't hate him. 76th percentile EPM, 59th on crafted. Offensive load was 80th percentile. And for a guy that's supposedly your best player and your number one, him sharing that offensive load with DeRozan as much as he did, like that does reduce what you get out of him. And I just thought we'd go back to a little bit more of what we saw the year before. So yeah, I, this one very clearly got wrong. Didn't expect the injuries, didn't expect the pissing and moaning, and didn't expect the efficiency to just disappear. But it did, so I was wrong. What about the rabbit hunter, Alex Caruso? When I was putting together these graphics here that you see if you're watching on YouTube, the number one that thing that stood out to me with Caruso is, oh, he's 30? Oh no, that's it, he's 30. 71 games, 29 minutes. He was the 71st ranked player in minus one. Yahoo's got him ranked at 42. Again, please do not, in your wildest dreams, consider picking Alex Caruso in round four unless you just have a humiliation fetish. Maybe you do. We all have our things that turn us on. Maybe it's ball men and headbands. I don't know. Pass the oil. Do you want to wear a headband? <laughs> but he was great. But get its opportunity. Now, he, he is, at times, their best player. Because defense does count. He is, at times, their best player. He is one of the best perimeter defenders in the entire NBA. Offensively, he's improved, but he's still never going to be this huge guy. But what do you do? What if there's Lonzo, Levine, DeRozan, Dasumu, White, and Caruso all on this team next season and healthy and playing? 
there's nowhere near enough minutes for him to do this again. And we know that he is a little bit of a locker room legend, though he played 71 games. 10 points, two threes, 3.8 rebounds, three and a half assists. But this is where it all comes in, isn't it? 1.7 steals and one block. Shot 41 on his threes, 76 from the line. So good numbers there. But it's all about the defense here for Caruso. Two threes, 1.7 steals, one block. He's elite with three and a half assists. It's fantastic. But we know what steals are. They're volatile. He's also never blocked shots anywhere near this in the past. And his rim contest numbers are actually low. He didn't contest a lot of shots. Just when he did, he just blocked it every time, basically. His best comps were year eight of Reggie Williams. That was when he was in Denver. And then Steel Merchant, Alvin Robertson. Again, check out Alvin Robertson's basketball reference page. I think there's three years we average just over three steals a game. The advanced stats have always loved Caruso because he is impactful. He's always impactful. 90th percentile EPM, 92nd on crafted. And in the regularized, I hate that word, regularized adjusted defensive turnovers, like how often you're creating turnovers, not just single season, but that's where the regularized adjuster comes in. 100th percentile, one of the best guys at generating turnovers. That is why he's impactful. Just literally the best player. But he's 30. The role is uncertain. He should be traded. You should have gotten first round picks for him. I'm not sure that I would draft him next season, to be honest. I'd need to see a lot more in this team. And he's 30. He's banged up. He's lower body injuries. He's foot injuries. He's ankle injuries. The cliff is going to hit this bloke like a truck. I do. I really worry it's going to hit him like an absolute truck. Think Patrick Beverly, but way less of an asshole. A guy that was this elite defensive player, and Crusoe's better than Beverly ever was. But at some point it hits you, and then you just are floundering, telling people to listen to your podcast. Maybe I should do that. Um, Kobe White, one of the big surprises of this season, a guy that was you know, most improved player. I am, I don't know what the right word is here. He's 24, he's young still, really young. 79 games, 36 minutes. So didn't get hurt. And played a million minutes. Now, we saw a little bit of this the end of last season. Down the stretch, White really improved. And he started shooting really well. And then he's one of those guys that was like, I just want him to get a shot at starting somewhere. I think there's a little bit in this. And the Bulls signed him for three years, 33. went, geez, that's so low, man. No team throwing an offer sheet out there. What are we doing? And then the whispers came in preseason that he was going to be the starting point guard. So I was like, okay, we draft him everywhere. We draft him around 10, round 11. We draft him everywhere. Didn't always catch on because he was only picked in 54% of leagues with an ADP of 139. But he finished 84th in minus one, 62nd over on Yahoo, 72nd on points, averaging 19 points, two and a half threes, four and a half rebounds, five assists, like Levine, putrid defensive stats, 45 from the field, 84 from the line, shooting 51 and 38 from two and three respectively. Here's where my concern is with White. Love this. There were some insane cold streaks and some insane hot streaks. That is a risky head-to-head proposition. That level of variability can either be one of those things that you take on and you get the hot streak at the right time and it wins you stuff, or it dies and you're just dead. But like I've said before, does he do any of this? I still think he was going to be good and worth holding, but does any of this happen if Levine plays? Does he get to playing 36 minutes a night? Does he average 19 points a game? I think the answer is no. Now, is he a better player for their future than Levine at five years younger? Yes. Is he a better player than Zach Levine ever was? Not yet, no. He's not. 70th percentile EPM, 52nd in crafted. What I do like is the two best player comps were year five Terry Rogier. That's first year in Charlotte, although that didn't go too well for Terry. And year three of Don Mitchell. What he needs to do is take free throws. 48th percentile free throw rate. That's a worry. That's how you become. And that's part of why the Mitchell comparison's there because Mitchell had a really poor free throw rate early in his career. And that's one of the things that was able to, that I've always said with Mitchell is he can be a top 10 fantasy guy, but he needs to get six, seven free throw attempts. And he's doing that now. But can Kobe do that? Does he have that much gravity to become that usage player and get to the line that much? That's, that's really what it is. Now, will he ever be a big assist player? Probably not. Steals, no. It's got to be free throws. So that's what we've got to watch. I do think that there is a gigantic risk of an overdraft of Kobe next season, like a round four pick, a round five pick. I think there's a big risk of this without, because we don't look at the context behind how he was able to do what he did this season. And that was 
Levine injury. But we all could also have no Lonzo, no Levine, no DeRozan. Other guys traded. White's playing 38 with bigger usage and better in year six. That's possible too. But we need that free throw rate up. And for as good as he was, and he was, I'm not sure that it's a full star level player there. The last guy I'm going to include in my group of starters is Patrick Williams. I'll start off with one thing about Patrick Williams. We are four years in to his career. It's been bad. He's still over a year younger than Dalton Connect, who there'll be many people wanting the Bulls to take at pick 11, even higher. He's over a year younger. He's like two years or a year and a half younger than Keegan and Chris Murray. Like he is insanely young. And I'm not suggesting that he's going to be as good as Keegan Murray next season. I Maybe he could be. I'm not suggesting that he'll even have a better career than what Dalton Connect ever will have. But he's ridiculously young. He played only 43 games after being an 82-game legend the year before. You would have thought he was Iron Man and he just could play every single game. But nah, that's not really how it works. 27 minutes a game and as per usual, started the season as the starter. Billy Donovan saw it went, oh, we can't anymore. I want my guy. You have to move on. He was benched the year before for Javante Green. I think he got benched this season for Tory Craig. Like That's who you're getting benched for. Repeat every year. 178th in minus one. 193rd in points. He was drafted, and, and I, I get that. Getting two threes, a block, and a steal, potentially, out of your last round pick in a year four player, who theoretically might be able to step up, is like a worthy flyer. He just, for, for the fourth year in a row, didn't work out. 10 points, four rebounds, four rebounds. One and a half threes, 0.9 steals, 0.8 blocks in 27 minutes, shot 40 from three. So he's done this for a few years now. I think he might actually just be a solid shooter. The problem is, is it's all like uncontested stuff. He's not really any, got any ability to self-create. And one of the things, and it's not really covered here in any of these numbers, is that you don't really, unless you get four or five blokes out, nothing changes. It's like a Jaden McDaniels. Like his role, just, he just doesn't know how to scale. 47 on twos, like I think you need to do better than that, my guy, as well. The best comps for him. Year three, Aaron Neesmith. That's last season, Neesmith in Indiana first year. Interesting. Neesmith, obviously a really low usage player who's really good defensively. So that's interesting. And Williams is a pretty good defender. And the other one is Dante Green year two. And I, yeah, I don't know what to say about that one. 66, 62nd percentile EPM, 35th in CPM. His creation turnover percentage, which is not just how often you turn it over, but how often do you turn it over compared to how often you're creating for the team. Bad, 16th percentile. Bro doesn't really create anything. And then when he does, he turns it over. Terrible. That's really bad. I. It's hard to give up on a bloke who's 22. It's hard to give up on a bloke who's basically missed two out of four seasons. It's hard to give up on a bloke who's never going to really get the touches with White, with Levine, with DeRozan there. And that could all change really quickly. But even in situations when he's being given an opportunity, he just does it for two games and then disappears again. I We are at the stage where I think he's a defensive Isaac Okoro type player who, if you're starting, you're always looking to upgrade. And when you're coming off the bench, you're just sort of doing stuff. That's not ideal, is it? Oh, as my voice cracks. Cracked voice legend. Let's look at the rest of the players or the ones that we do need to pay attention to here. You'll note in the other players to note section that I didn't talk about Ayo Desumu in the group of starters, even though Desumu was in the team's most commonly used starting lineup. But why did I not include him there? Because it took two starters getting injured before Desumu was able to start. Now, Desumu wasn't even necessarily always even close to being a big rotation guy most of the year. He fell off significantly in the year before, year two, and started this season out pretty poorly. And I have been really, you know, relatively critical, I think, of Desumu as a player and his upside prospects. Maybe you'll say I'm being critical here again by not putting him as a starter. I just don't see how he would start over any of those other guys. He's 24, still pretty young. 76 games, 29 minutes. And nearly, but nearly all of that came towards the end of the season when Williams and Levine were out. They started him, he played big minutes, and he was really, really good. But does... If you are going, okay, well, he was good. So we're, let's build our team around 35 minutes a night of Ayo Dusumu. And there's almost no way that's going to happen. When they decided they wanted to go double big, who was the guy that moved to the bench? It was Dusumu. 
he's not locked into any sort of starting role at all. He finished 145th in fantasy this season. 97th on Yahoo rankings again. Please don't take him in the top 100. 12 points, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, 0.9 steals. He shot 40% from 3. That's really, really good. I wasn't really sure which way his shooting was going to go. Some good moments and bad moments, but really strong. And I'm getting convinced that he is actually just a really efficient player. But in 29 minutes, that's 30 minutes a night, 12, 3, and 3 with 0.9 steals. That's just not exciting at all. And I don't know how you have a better scenario than you did this season. The best comp for him is year two of Malcolm Brogdon, post-Rookie of the Year. That's a pretty good player. Brogdon was able to scale up his usage, and we've seen a little bit of that from DeSumo, so I'm not going to rule him out completely. The next one was um, NBL legend year four, Ian Clark, when he was in the on the Warriors. Played a little bit for the Pelicans too. And that's like, the Brogdon's a great scenario. The Clark one is not so much. 60th percentile EPM, 31st on crafted. What was interesting is his actual box creation metric was 70th percentile in the NBA. So they're asking him to do a lot. And I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm not really sure that that's ever going to be his role unless a team is winning 17 games. So again, like when we talk a little bit about Caruso, we talk about Kobe White, we might talk about Vooch. I think a lot of what happened for so many of these players, like that could be best case scenario for the next two or three years unless the Bulls actually move on from Vooch or move on from DeRozan or trade Levine. But they might not. So maybe DeSumo is playing 22 minutes a night again next season. I uh, have yeah, very, like, it was good. He was impressive. I'm just not sure that it's like, well, we have found our guy. Let's move other pieces around so that it makes sense for DeSumo. I don't really think that you could sit down and think that that makes sense. Or maybe you can. I don't think you can, though. Let's talk about their backup center, the big avocado, Andre Drummond, who has had such a weird career. He's had unbelievably good fantasy seasons, all-star seasons for the Pistons, some of the worst basketball you will ever see when he played for the Cavs and for the Lakers, remodeled himself to a low-usage backup big in Philadelphia, did a little bit of that here in Chicago as well, flashed an ability to improve his free throws, became a passer, like, and bro just turned 30. I feel like he's 100 years old. There were plenty of times last season where the Bulls would have been better if he started over Vooch. I've got no question about that. But he's also not a player where people go, well, they just, Vooch is a, Drummond's a starter. He needs to start 30 minutes a night, play him next to Vooch. This is the solution. He is not that guy. Him, me saying that he might have been a better option to start over Vooch is an indictment on Vooch, not a praise of Drummond. And it wouldn't have been in all situations. Drummond had a little opportunity there where they gave him minutes playing as a, as a center next to Vooch as the power forward. It worked a little bit, but they went with it in very, very specific matchups and then went away from it again. He still has the outlines of a good fantasy game. 176th in minus one, averaging eight and a half points, nine rebounds, 0.9 steals and 0.6 blocks in 17 minutes only. He shot 59 from the line as per usual, 56 on his twos. The best comps for him, Year seven of Hassan Whiteside, which is the final year in Miami. And then year nine of Hassan Whiteside, which I believe was Sacramento or Portland. I can't remember that one. And that makes a ton of sense. 75th percentile EPM, 74th on crafted. He doesn't, like for as interesting as he is, he's not a good defender. He doesn't contest shots at the rim. 51st percentile rim to contest frequency. And nobody should be paying him like he is a starter. So he's like people, he got drafted in six percent of leagues in fantasy. But I, for what reason, I have no idea. At one hundred and thirty-seven as well, which is not even the final round. But that makes no sense to me. I know that he gets rebounds, but that's just not anywhere close to being what you need to do there. He's thirty-one. He's unrestricted. The Bulls should probably look to bring him back, but that would depend on what they do in the draft. If I could get a center at eleven, I would. Hopefully, move them into being a starter at some point. But Drummond is just destined to be the backup. He'll have the occasional flash game. You stream him in on a Sunday because I really need eight rebounds and maybe he gets that. But overall, it's this is who he is. I'm not going to talk about Javon Carter or Honor Alp Batim. I'm not going to talk about Andrew Funk or Julian Phillips. But I am going to talk about Dalen Terry as the last player we go through here because he was their first round pick two years ago. And... Maybe this is going to get me stuck in the wrong spot in terms of draft evaluation. But 
This man, Dalen Terry, who's this super size six 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 seven point guard from Arizona, didn't really play much point guard in the NBA so far. But one of the biggest red flags that was not even enough was a red flag in college. It was a flag that went ah, it's a little weird, isn't it? Is he came out with like sixteen percent usage, and that to me, as any sort of guard or perimeter player, if I see anyone with that level usage, I'm just going to say they're not going to be good. Because it just it was such a red flag as a point guard on that team. He was playing with Ben Mather in that team. But it's translated over exactly how you think it would in the NBA. He's passive. He can't shoot. What does he do? Defensively, like he's not bad. But we're heading into year three of Terry and we've just never seen him play. He's 22. He played 59 games, sure, 12 minutes a night. The fantasy numbers are all putrid. Three points, two rebounds, one and a half assists, half a steal. Shot 23 on his three, somehow 63 on his twos, but I don't actually care about any of those numbers. The best comps for him, Aaron McKee, rookie year, or Delano Banton, rookie year. I get the Banton one, that makes sense. 48th percentile EPM, 69th on crafted. His deflections, 81st percentile. Defensively, he does this. He did this in college. Nice, long, pesty sort of player. But, bro... This team has needed forwards. It's needed help with ball movement. For two years, you're a first-round pick and you just will not, you cannot play. Your G League numbers are not inspiring. They probably won't do this, but there's, why would you pick up his fourth-year rookie option? What for at this point? Just to clog the roster because you don't want to admit you made a mistake. Got a James Booknight him. Get him out of here. I just don't think he's up to it. Again, he's barely played. He's 21. It's year three. Maybe you give him that extra year, but bloody hell, I'm not. Um, I'm not super convinced about Dale and Terry at all from any sort of dynasty perspective. And that low usage college player, I think he was even a sophomore, very young sophomore. But that is feeling to me like a giant red flag for future prospects. And that's the end of this depressing ass franchise, the Chicago Bulls. Not the end of the franchise. It's the end of me talking about the franchise in this season review series. So. Bulls fans, tell me how unfair I'm being. Non-Bulls fans, tell me how Nah Vooch is actually good. Nah, DeRozan's actually him. He's a baller. He's a clutch player. Tell me all that stuff. Tell me I'm wrong. Go ahead. Let, let it rip. And by the way, DeRozan was really clutch this year. Fantastic in, in that sense. My, all, my criticisms always on DeRozan have been, that's great. Ooh, we're not playing one-on-one. How do we build teams to be good with you there? with what you demand because of your individual stats and and price. That's where you run into problems, I think. And that is the end of today's show. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, and of course, on anywhere you find Bias Chicago Bulls stuff. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.